Hi, and welcome to the next webinar in our Plante webinar series. My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few things just to make sure you get the most out of attending today's webinar. If you're having trouble connecting or need to leave the webinar early, know that a recording of this webinar will be made available along with all of the associated materials within a few days. You'll notice that there is a chat area open. This section is for you to connect with your colleagues by introducing yourself, say where you are from, and let us know about any technical issues. If you have questions for our panelists, please let us know about those using the Zoom's question and answer Q&A section. Questions that are specifically for our panelists should be shared within the Q&A section so that it will be easier for our moderators to navigate. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for plant scientists, powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today to support this series and use the discount code webinar10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. Be sure to check out the archive of our previous webinars and follow us on social media. The hashtag for this series is Plante Webinar. This webinar was jointly organized by ASPB's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, as well as the Women in Plant Biology Committee. Miguel Vega Sanchez and Laura Wayne are here to represent these committees and serve as moderators for this session. I'm going to turn it over, them, over to them now to say a little bit more about their committees and get the discussion started. Thank you, Miguel and Laura. Thank you, Katie. Um, do you have the, the next slide? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I uh, am representing the Women in Plant Biology Committee. I was actually the previous chair of the committee. Um, Eva Farah has taken over um, as role of chair of this committee. Um, so the Women in Plant Biology Committee, um, really our vision is to embrace a a fully diverse and rich um, community um, and promote gender equality. Our, our mission is really promoting that gender equality, diversity, and career development. And we like to have some of these uh, leadership and career development opportunities for our, um, for our community. So you can join our network on Plante um, and we can put the, the links in the chat as well. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. And Miguel, would you like to talk a little sure. bit about the CIC? Yes, thank you, Katie and, and Laura. So yes, I'm the I'm Miguel Vega Sanchez. I'm at Bear Crop Science in St. Louis. I've been a scientist there for now six years. And I'm also the chair of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee here at ASPB. So our committee has recently got, has gone through a little bit of a process to revamp our mission and vision. So we used to be known as a minority affairs committee for those of you that have been at ASPB for a long time, but now we decided to rebrand it and actually capture the most um, up-to-date kind of view of what we mean by diversity, which includes not only what the previous minority affairs committee was focused, which was mostly ethnic diversity, but kind of broaden that a little bit more to include people in early career, in industry, government, in addition to academics, and also try to make sure that, that we create an environment that works and that the society is ready to include everybody in, 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 in the society that, that, that is part of, of, of its membership. So our vision is really an American society of plant biologists that welcomes, represents, retains, and develops a multi multifaceted community of plant scientists. We have members from different universities, uh, professors, and, and also we have members that are early career scientists from the recently created early career professional section of plant biology. So Asia Hightower and Brianna Griffin are two graduate students that are part of our committee and very actively involved in, in, in our committee in addition to the other members that, that you probably recognize from, from either your universities or, or, or interactions with them in, at the conference. So, Really excited to have this panel discussion today with us, we, we, uh, to have you all uh, us, uh, here, and I'll leave it up to Laura to kickstart the conversation. 
Thank you, Miguel. Um, so we're going to have each of the panelists inter introduce themselves. Um, and so we'll just kind of go around um, quickly and have each panelist introduce kind of who they are, where their career path has taken them, and kind of touching on when and where and how they decided to, to leave the lab bench, or if that just kind of happened naturally through, through their career. Um, so we can just start with, you know, whoever wants to jump in and kind of jump around. I can go first. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Candace Seavey. Um, my current role is a as senior science advancement manager for TechXL. Um, TechXL is an agriculture technology development organization. Um, so we are an investment group uh, that's specifically focused in um, developing agriculture technologies, both in animal health as well as uh, crop sciences. Um, so my path uh, to this position, I, I attended graduate school at Texas A&M University. Um, I got a PhD in uh, plant molecular biology and plant genetics with my training. And uh, after graduating, I um, took on a postdoctoral position at, at Texas A&M studying uh, Pseudomonas bacteria, a couple different species. species. Um, and that, that was a pretty short postdoc and thought it was not quite the right fit for me. Uh, and so I, I did a second postdoc at the University of Missouri in, it was a USDA uh, postdoc position in Mel Oliver's lab. And I was studying uh, water deficit stress responses mm -hmm. in maize roots. Um, and um, so in my progression from graduate school through that first postdoc and then the second postdoc, I really was moving toward more of a translational research. Um, so uh, graduate school is pretty basic research, postdoctoral position was pretty basic research. And then I was starting to realize that uh, that was not a good fit for me. And that's why I pursued that USDA postdoctoral position and, and did that. Um, and then I, I still, you know, that still wasn't, wasn't what I was looking for. Um, so I chose to, to transition and I joined Tech Excel three years ago and I, that's why I ended up here. Um, I'll go next if that's all right. <laughs> um, my name's Janet Obert. I actually, um, I've been with Monsanto and then Slash Bear for 32 years. I started right out of my bachelor's degree at Washington University. So I had a chemistry degree and went into uh, Monsanto at the time doing safety studies for our agrochemical products. So glyphosate being among them. Um, did that for several years, got an opportunity to, to do some basic research as well on seed treatments for which I got a patent, which was you know, a happy thing for me because it was on my bucket list. Um, and, and then I, you know, Monsanto went through a phase where it's clear the biotech um, work was going to start taking more of a central role in our portfolio. So I went back, um, got a master's in biology again at WashU for, um, for a few, it took a few years. And as I did that, I was also working in our biotech regulatory doing safety studies again through um, for about five years or so. During the process of that, I also got the opportunity to, to do some lab management and project management budgets, um, which I actually swore up down and sideways. I would not do budgets, um, but somehow that's now what I do. <laughs> um, and it, I got the chance to do that within a smaller group, built it as I went through um, various organizational shifts and management shifts and to the point where about the time I actually got my master's degree, I took a role in uh, regulatory, so global regulatory operations, doing global budget management, and then spent the next 10 years doing that, as well as project portfolio management, kind of helping to set the priorities within the regulatory organization. We're kind of at the very back end of, of what happens um, as a product comes out the door, chemistry or biotech, and you know, being able to really manage how we, we used our resources and align those. And I, you know, the use of my master's degree was actually really um, important in that because as you think through the biology and the science of what we were doing um, and what was coming through the pipeline, I really got to use my science background to, to really assess the projects as they were coming through. I would hear the research proposals. I would hear, 
you know, this is how X, Y, or Z product is, is coming through the system, what its data look like, um, how it's working, how it's performing, and then tying that to the commercial business is to, is that performance and what that product is doing um, in these safety studies and regulatory trials really tying itself to what our customers are going to need. Um, did that for about 10 years and then actually worked within the crop teams doing that more holistically across you know, cotton, soybeans, and other specialty projects, looking again across the portfolio, what's our best way to spend our research dollars in those crops um, to provide something that our customers are gonna find valuable. This summer, I actually switched slightly again. Um, and now I work within our seed production innovation team within our product supply group. So the, the product supply that creates all those seeds that we go out and sell for our crop science um, organization, it's, you know, you only get one shot a season to make these things happen, right? So um, the group I'm currently the portfolio finance and operations lead for goes in and really does a huge amount of research to enable those products to go through that product supply chain. They also do a lot of really basics, really cool research of putting together new technologies, new innovations, taking x-rays and NIRs and, and all sorts of other things to, to think about how they can improve seed production and seed quality as they come out the door. So get the opportunity to get a really large breadth of what we're doing from a, a research and innovation perspective um, while still, you know, taking that out of the lab piece um, and helping the rest of the teams that are still in the lab get their work done. Awesome. Lenore, you can go next. Okay. All right. So, hi, I'm Lenore Reiser and I'm a, currently a bio curator at the Rapidopsis Information Resource which is housed at Phoenix Bioinformatics, which is a small independent nonprofit located now virtually in space. Um, and I have, um, I'll try to make this really, really concise. Um, I actually did uh, my PhD at UC Berkeley with Bob Fisher. And even when I was a graduate student, I kind of had an inkling that like being a faculty person was not the direction that I wanted to go in. Um, but I um, continued in doing a postdoc with Sarah Hake for about uh, three years, which was totally wonderful. She was an amazing mentor, as, as was Bob. So I've had the benefit of having really supportive and wonderful mentors throughout my, my career. Um, and while I was a postdoc with Sarah, the opportunity came up to take this position uh, back at Terre when it initially, that when the project initially started, whatever, like 20 years ago. And I thought that this was a really great opportunity. And I realized now as I'm saying this, it's like, I think I'm a startup junkie. I realized that the thread that's kind of following through is like, I really like building new things and starting things up. And like the Terra project when I joined it initially was a startup. And while I was at Terra at the Carnegie Institution down on the Stanford campus, I had the opportunity to start up a new project down there with um, Chris Somerville, which was uh, starting up an undergraduate research, uh, summer research program. And so while I was at Terre, I actually transitioned into doing educational outreach and particularly focused on research training programs and particularly towards people who were um, underrepresented in the sciences. And some of that has to do with my own very non-traditional um, way that I got into, into science and into research. And so I actually left Terre um, after about six years, and then I went to go work at a nonprofit in Berkeley that had a research training program. And from there, I went to UC Berkeley and I worked for the Biology Scholars Program, which is one of the most amazing um, uh, 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 equity-based um, uh, undergraduate uh, program in any university. It's like, it's a phenomenal program run by a guy named John Matsui. And, um, I was there for, for a number of years um, before taking time out. So I came to parenthood late in my life. And so I took some time out when uh, we adopted our son and went back. So I had this brief moment, I would say my, my one um, uh, sort of close experience with like the real tech startup world was working for Breakout Labs, which is the product of the Teal Foundation which was a crazy experience. And so I, I worked in this sort of venture philanthropy space for a little while before coming back to Terre. And I, I have to say, I'd always been 
um, connected to that project. Even after I left, I continued to work as a curator. I continued to maintain that relationship because fundamentally, I really love the mission. I love what it is that, that we do and how it advances science without me necessarily having to ever pick up, pipe, pick up a pipette again. Um, so anyway, yeah, so it's been sort of a, a somewhat of a circle, but I think a very inclusive one. Charlie, do you wanna go next? Sure, if uh, happy to do that. So uh, Charlie Romano, I'm a senior patent agent at Thompson Coburn, uh, which is a uh, large general practice law firm in downtown St. Louis. And um, just to sort of go through the chronology, how I got here, uh, started off uh, undergraduate degree, microbiology, UMass Amherst, uh, biochemistry degree, Harvard, and uh, went and did a postdoc with uh, Harry Klee at Monsanto because I decided I wanted to do plant work. And uh, basically, uh, while I was there, I really got turned on to doing, uh, making science work, uh, bringing science uh, out of the lab and uh, into people's hands, into the fields, and uh, took a position at Monsanto working on uh, insect control products. Uh, did that for roughly about 10 years. And it was really at that time I got exposed to IP for the first time because uh, it was pretty pivotal, uh, you know, not only for those products, but for any products and uh, being able to capture value. Uh, long story short, uh, left Monsanto after uh, 11 great years there. Uh, worked for a couple of startups. Uh, one of them I'm very proud to say is uh, APATH LLC, which was founded by Charlie Rice at uh, now at Rockefeller, formerly at Wash U. You, you may gather that this was the guy who won the uh, Nobel Prize for his work on HCV. So uh, enjoyed that time, more exposure to patents, uh, more recognition of how important patents were to uh, starting a company. Uh, you know, Charlie's company had the basis of some very strong IP that he secured around HCV while at Washington University. Uh, after that, uh, I was consulting with another company and I was consulted uh, by a former uh, head patent counsel at Monsanto then at a law firm in St. Louis asking me if I'd like to come on to their law firm as a part-time basis as a tech advisor. Uh, so I said, uh, yeah, you know, look, I've always enjoyed patent work, uh, happy to help out. Uh, did that, found that I really liked it, uh, decided to uh, go uh, become a patent agent, which entails uh, sitting for the patent bar exam. Uh, at about that time, I was recruited to Thompson Coburn, uh, passed the patent bar, and I've been a uh, practicing uh, patent agent at Thompson Coburn uh, for the past 15 years. And, uh, you know, what I do is uh, work with startup companies, work with multinational companies, also work with uh, tech transfer operations at various universities, uh, advancing uh, uh, what they're finding in the lab uh, through uh, into patent applications and to granted patents. So uh, that's what I'm all about and uh, really looking forward to talking about uh, some of the opportunities in uh, IP for uh, people with PhDs. Kathy, would you like to go next? Sure. So hi, I'm Kathy Monkvold. I lead the open innovation platform at Corteva AgriScience. And you may know that Corteva is the pure play agriculture company that spun out of the Dow DuPont merger a few years ago. And we have an open innovation platform that where we aim to collaborate more broadly, more openly, and in a more agile way than we ever have before with scientists out in the academic community or in, um, in the industry community at startups and small companies. So um, 
my, my scientific training is in molecular plant pathology. I got my PhD at Cornell University in the plant pathology department, and then made my way up the street to the Boyce Thompson Institute, where I did a postdoc, uh, transitioning from working on the microbe side of the plant pathogen interaction to then the plant side of the interaction. Uh, during my postdoc, I began to become interested in careers beyond the bench and explored a few opportunities while still a postdoc getting experience in different spaces, and then uh, looked into some policy fellowships in the DC area. And actually, I got a policy fellowship at uh, the American Society of Plant Biologists. So it's, it's great to be back here again, interacting in, in new ways. But I spent some time uh, during that policy fellowship at ASPB, and then eventually graduated to leading the public affairs and science policy efforts um, of the society for a little bit. Um, as, as my time came to a close at ASPB, I was realizing that I was, I was missing um, being integrally involved in innovation myself. Um, it was amazing putting together uh, the diverse perspectives from all the people in the, the different fields of plant biology, but I wanted to get back into, into research. So I did return to research, uh, holding roles at a small company called Keygene Inc. in the Rockville area and then moved to a larger life sciences company, Beckman Coulter, uh, in Indianapolis. And so uh, there, I led a, a small research team where we developed genomics reagents, and I was first introduced to the concept of open innovation. And from the research side, I participated in collaborations, helping to provide sort of an end-to-end -end solution for researchers on next-gen uh, sequencing library prep. And that sort of led me to my path now doing open innovation as my main job at Corteva. And so I... I wanted to comment like Leonor, um, that sometimes we don't see the, the thread that connects everything we do until we look back a little later. Um, and for me, it really was collaboration. I participated in collaborations as a graduate student and as a postdoc, um, both multidisciplinary type collaborations. Um, and then that sort of wove through all of the experiences I've, I've had now. Um, and sometimes I even joke that uh, some of my first author papers back in my graduate school days and my postdoc days had co-first authors. So it really has been something that's continued throughout my career. So happy to, to explore any of these uh, roles I've had a bit further with you today and just uh, excited to be part of this. Thank you. Um, Ed, would you like to introduce yourself and talk a little about your career path? Uh, we can't hear you, actually. I'm double okay, there we go. Uh, yep, sorry. Apologies for being a few minutes late. Uh, so yeah, so my, my background, I went to Iowa State University and I'm um, actually started in engineering and moved out of engineering into science because I really enjoyed the, the bench work and being in the lab and uh, working on RNA and understanding RNA biology and had the opportunity to move to Oregon State and work on some of the early work on microRNAs and interaction of microRNAs in plant development. And that led me to taking a position at Monsanto to help them develop that technology for use in our, our crop pipeline. And uh, it was, it was a really fun time in my career because I really enjoyed working at the lab bench and spent a couple years helping develop that technology for crops. When an opportunity opened up to move to lead our, our corn yield pipeline, um, which was a really fun time to um, take a really di slightly different direction in my career, leading a small team of scientists and trying to understand yields and how, how, how we can improve that in corn. I was, it was fun. I, I didn't really hit that, not seen my career moving to managing people, but it was really fun to help 
a young scientist develop in their career and, and guide them and uh, really build out and be able to do so much more with with a team. And I think we we talked about collaboration earlier. Um, it was a big part of that where we were working with a lot of, of other universities and companies to try to bring in technology to understand yield. Um, and it was really, I, I very much enjoyed still working at the bench and, and having scientists and being around scientists. Uh, but it was, I have really had a lot of challenges of trying to bring new technologies into our pipeline. And uh, I was approached five years ago to take a, a role in our quality and compliance team, which is a direction I never really thought about going in my career because it very much took me, or at least I felt it took me away from the science. But after, after a couple of years of, of prodding to move into that space, um, I really did enjoy it because it, it gave me an opportunity to really help enable some of those technologies and make it into our, our pipeline and understand the aspects of, of quality and compliance and how that gets to be part of our everyday, everyday work in the lab and, and really learned a lot about our regulatory systems and how to, to not only do the science, but take it to be a product. Um, which led me to changing roles again this past year and moving a little bit back closer to the science to our, our regulatory team to help advance the products and help people understand how, how our science relates to the products that we're developing. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I actually fully introduced myself, but I work at Corteva Agri Science. I am actually uh, in the lab. Um, I do get to go in the lab and, and do bench work. Um, so I, where I am in, in R&D is trait discovery and it's at kind of that earliest um, phase of, the, of the, the trait development pipeline. So reading the literature, looking for, for new targets to test uh, CRISPR targets or whatever it is. Um, so I am still you know, working in the lab. Um, I do also um, have a small group of people that I, I manage um, and I lead some larger projects. So it is a little harder um, as I progress in my career to, to go back into the lab and find time in my schedule to go into the lab. Um, so I wanted to ask the, the panelists another question about um, how, you're, you're, how closely you are involved with technical research. So most of you, so you now are in your roles are not working you know, tech, you know, at the lab bench, um, but innovation is really key part of, of research. Um, and how do you still maintain or support um, that innovation? So I wanna start with Charlie. Sure. So, uh, you know, basically, uh, I see the science sort of coming hot off the press, if, if you will. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looking at things uh, before they're published, and they are, by definition, uh, novel and non-obvious and new. Uh, so, uh, you know, basically what this entails is, uh, is being up on what is new. Uh, so, for example, I, I can assure you, uh, no one knew about RNAi or CRISPR when I came out of graduate school. But, you know, here they are, and people are expecting me to draft patent applications that capture their new ideas about how to use those technologies. So, even though I'm not doing this, thank goodness, because we want the experiments to work, uh, I do translate that into a patent application that captures uh, the inventor's ideas and protects them. Does somebody else want to answer um, that question or address how they, they, they're involved with um, innovation and correlated with research? Lunar? Uh, so I think that what I love the most about my job is actually how we do this supporting of innovation and research. So the, the thing that attracted me the most about working at TEAR was the fact that we are constantly um, embedded in the, in the research process, right? So at, you know, TEAR is a, a genome database for Arabidopsis for anybody who's here who, who doesn't know what it is. So we are constantly, you know, keep having to keep up on all of the literature in terms of like what it is that researchers are doing. 
and trying to, you know, modify and accommodate what we do in order to be able to um, handle new information. And then um, from like on my sort of like daily, you know, um, space in my job, it's that we also have to think about like, um, you know, new um, paradigms with data, right? So how do we manage data? You know, we're interested in learning about new things like machine, machine learning, learning and artificial intelligence. So, you know, it's not just that we're consuming, um, you know, what's going on in the, at the bench for, for plant biologists, but that we're also, you know, thinking about ways of innovating what we're doing, you know, at, at Phoenix itself. So it's really, it's very exciting. I think it's completely tied to it. Laura, let's try to dive into some of the questions we received. We have about eight good. questions. So one question that is pretty general, I would like anybody to jump in and answer, but uh, what degrees do you need to get into research and what types of careers involve research? Can I see, I'll take a quick stab sure. at that. I Go ahead. think one of the things I found really interesting when I joined Monsanto is I could not tell the difference between somebody that had a bachelor's, master's or PhD it was it was much more about people that had good critical thinking and could could come up with ideas and execute experiments and work well as a team i i, I really didn't see that the degree mattered as much as as the quality of the people that we had yeah and yeah, I, I think didn't... you answer about three of the same questions already with with that answer so great very efficient <laughs> anybody else I would just say I saw one of the the questions also was you know what can you do with a master's degree as well and then a little more specifically and I actually have the master's so <laughs> I can answer that one um, I will say I agree with Ed I you know when I left and got my bachelor's degree just coming out of school I was warned that I would I, I would do would be washing dishes in the lab or doing really routine things but I found that as Ed said once you get into the the, the research and you get into the role, it really comes down to what can you do? How do you think? How do you work? Um, what can you bring to the table regardless of what degree you came with? I will say um, one of the reasons I did switch from the lab into something different was um, lacking that PhD. I, I kind of hit after about 10 years, I hit a point where I was kind of told, look, without the PhD, you really can't go too much farther in science. Um, I could have stayed in the lab and had a great time um, and been very well valued. So not to say that that was not the case. Um, I could have had a, a great time there. Um, but I to, to kind of move up into higher level grades it was really at that point, I needed to make that switch out of the lab. And so that's when I kind of started moving towards those this project management and those roles that would actually put me more in the operations um, side of things. Um, and then I was just really open to learning the finance and project management and all those other little side skills um, that kind of helped me move past, past the bench um, and to create what I think has been a really, a really nice career beyond the bench, even though we were talking earlier, I still some days wish I could go back and play in the lab a little bit. <laughs> Some days it would be much more fun. Great. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, I'm just going to interject real quickly here that it, at least in, in patent law and biotech, it's become increasingly important, uh, whether justified or not, to have the doctoral degree. So, you know, most of the law firms and even a lot of the in house patent departments are going to be looking for people, uh, if they're patent agents, to have a, a doctoral degree and even uh, for their attorneys to have both a law and a doctoral degree. So fair or not, that's sort of the way it is right now. Excellent. Charlie, I think there were a couple of questions for you. Can you define what the patent bar is? Sure. So what interested you about patent work? So why did you like it? Right. So uh, just real quickly on the patent bar. So uh, this is an, an examination that anybody who wants to practice patent law before the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has to pass. And uh, 
it is a very difficult exam, I can tell you. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's something that is going to easily entail uh, 100 plus hours of study uh, and even practical experience uh, helps to pass that exam. Uh, but what it really attracted me to it was uh, that uh, I, I liked writing, I liked arguing, uh, and I liked science. And it sort of brings all those things together. Uh, and then plus, you know, as I told the panel earlier, I get to see the really cool science that works uh, and get to try to secure patent uh, protection for it. Uh, now, I want to be clear, like any job, it isn't always, you know, daisies and unicorns. Uh, you have to deal with a lot of uh, bureaucracy with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, that can be challenging at times, but on balance, uh, you know, I just think it's a great idea, a great option for bringing together all of those elements of uh, writing, reading, critical thinking, uh, and always being exposed to something new. Uh, I'm looking at new science and the laws changing all the time as well. So uh, it's, it's, it's challenging, it's interesting, and uh, it's just worked out great for me. Great, thanks, Charlie. Another question that has received a lot of upvotes is, how can grad students prepare for careers beyond the lab bench while still in grad school? Go I ahead, can... Lenore. I think. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Kathy or Lenore. Go ahead. Um, I'll take a stab at it. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, at least in, in my experience, it's been really important to seek out those sort of different experiences where you are currently. So I took time during my postdoc and participated in our postgrad society and organized an event on careers beyond the bench um, at, at, the, at the Institute. Um, I also took an opportunity to teach a, a freshman seminar class with my postdoc advisor um, on uh, comparative innate immunity, just not because I had to, but I really wanted to explore some, some different communication type of experiences that I wouldn't get just working in the lab. So I think, you know, getting out there and, and getting those unique experiences that will, will kind of pave the way toward uh, these different careers is, is a good path forward. Yeah, can I just... I want to say, I mean, to jump on that and say, yes, it's really, really important to, um, to look around at different opportunities to avail yourself of whatever opportunities come up. So things like this, that'll give you an opportunity to educate yourself, but also making sure that you set some time aside for that. Um, I think, you know, finding um, supportive mentors who will encourage you to pursue lots of different opportunities. Like if you think that you're interested in, you know, tech transfer and you're at a university, you know, get in touch with people in the tech transfer office and see if there's opportunities to, you know, do like a, you know, mini rotation or, you know, I mean, you know, just, you know, if there's, um, if you're interested in startups or something like that, you know, find, you know, find people in your, in your business school or something like that, that you can talk to. I think that there's lots of opportunities that you just have to make time for it. Don't be dissuaded and don't let people tell you that it's not important for you to do. I think that's really important that, you know, be, you know, stick with people who are gonna encourage you and not people who are going to, you know, tell you that, that you're not serious about science if you're thinking about leaving the bench. And a little different perspective that, I think one of the things you learn a lot about science while you're in grad school, but if you're going to move out of that career, one of the major things that, that people do is they take on people management and people management skills are, are really critical. And there, there's not a lot of opportunities. To, you, you can't take a class necessarily on that. And so if there's opportunities as a grad student you know, to work with undergrad students and, and help them and learn those people management skills that you can take to later parts of your career. It's, it's a really good time. And, and I really enjoyed that as part of my, my, 
graduate work and my postgraduate work, helping to to lead the the, the younger scientists and and teach them and build those skills that I could take later as I moved into a people management role. Thanks. Another question here. So what do you think is an essential skill to improve before taking serious transition steps from academia to industry? Does somebody want to jump in? <laughs> Uh, so I can I can comment on that. Um, I, I don't think this is a skill that's uh, necessary just to transition. I think it's probably a skill that's extremely critical in whatever career path you're going to go down, and that is to be a very thoughtful and effective communicator, um, both scientifically. I mean, uh, we may not always notice it, but scientists communicate differently than the rest of the world, uh, both negatively and positively, I think. Um, and it's it's important to be able to, to communicate with the general public uh, as well. I think our tendency as scientists a lot of times is to really focus on how we did something, which is uh, important in the right context, but equally important is to be able to communicate why, why you did something, why is it important that you're doing this research, why do you want to change careers. Um, so uh, any opportunities for training in uh, in communication and, and in honing those skills, I think are really important. Anybody else? I'm transitioning academia from academia to industry. Skills that you would need. I didn't find it that much different because a lot of the, the folks when I moved from from my postgraduate work into industry, you're still working with scientists. And a lot of them had been in academia. And they're, they're the same people that you're working with. So a lot of the same skills and communication will translate to that. It's, it's a lot more about you're just changing your focus from from often basic research to more applied research. I just wanted to echo a little bit what Candace said, though, as you if you can contemplate and going from the bench off the bench. Um, <clears throat> one of my biggest difficulties when I first did that was how to communicate with managers, um, you know, customers, people down the line, you know, people up higher up in the hierarchy who had a really broad view. And, and I was used to, as you said, data and what happened and what I did. And it was uh, just a really hard switch for me to, to move to the why did I do it? What does it really mean? Don't bog them down with details, um, which were really important when I was on the bench. The data was everything, right? But when you are trying to communicate up and talk about the impact of what you're doing, the data is important that it's beneath the surface, but the impact of it's what's really important. So being able to, to take what you've got and, and articulate it in a way that, um, you know, non-scientists or those who have a really broad view of things can, can digest and keep in their heads as talking points is a really important skill to, to learn. Good, thanks everybody. So another one is about switching from being a faculty and transitioning to a non-academic position. I don't know if we have anybody with that experience in the panel, but. Yeah, I, I have a, a bit of a related experience okay. where, uh, you know, a number of years ago, a, a faculty member came to me asking about making a transition uh, out of a faculty position uh, into patent law. And, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of things in a faculty position that really train you quite well. Uh, for that type of transition uh, where, I mean, basically you need to think critically uh, and you need to write very well to have any hope of getting a grant. And those are skills that are very directly transferable uh, to working uh, as a patent agent or as a patent attorney. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, anybody else? 
I think I've seen that happen, you know, at, at least at Monsanto, we've had some folks that have been faculty members that have transitioned to, to industry. And I don't think it happens very often though, but it does happen. And some cases it is professors that are retiring, you know, they're done with academia and they just continue their career in industry as consultants or, you know, as, you know, leaving academia altogether and, and starting from scratch in a way. I think one of the big um, differences between academia and industry is working as a team. And mm -hmm. in, in academia, you're so used to saying, oh, I discovered this and I did this. And you, know, you, you do everything from the beginning all the way to the end of the, the project. Whereas industry, we're working much more as a team where you know, different people are doing different parts of the project. Um, it's more of a we mentality. Um, I would say is kind of the uh, one of the changes I noticed going from academia into industry. Yeah, I'm just going to also add that you know I've run into quite a few faculty who have gotten the entrepreneurial bug, and have gone and and left uh, university positions for for startups. And uh, you know the, the one thing I will say is those that are successful not only grasp what Laura just alluded to but also grasp the difference between grant money and investor money. And with the latter, um, it, it, you have to deliver to investors what you say you're going to deliver by way of a, a, a product or an IP portfolio or uh, a technology platform that you're promising. Uh, so, you know, I think that's a, a, a key thing to think about and you know, I'd certainly seek out as mentors, uh, other faculty members who have made that leap, if that's something you choose to do. Yeah, I just want to sort of throw out there too, that, you know, for people who are out there in the audience who are at sort of early stages, you know, thinking about PhD programs, something to sort of consider is the type of PhD program that you go into, that if you are thinking about um, you know, pursuing, you know, potentially something that's more entrepreneurial, you might want to actually like consider looking at a graduate program where things like that are supported. So, you know, there are like UC Berkeley has, you know, inc startup incubators, and I think uh, lots of opportunities for, um, for students to actually pursue, you know, that, that intersection of, you know, entrepreneurship and, and biology, you, you know, think very carefully about whose lab that you go into and, um, and what graduate programs that you might apply to if you think that you wanna explore other paths besides academia. And we also have um, internships available. So if you are interested in going to industry, I'd highly recommend trying to do an internship um, either as an undergraduate or as a graduate student. I know at Corteva, we have internship positions. I'm sure Bear, I know you have an internship mm -hmm. program as well. We do. We definitely do, yeah. So one question that I think we get quite a bit is if you're thinking about switching from academia to industry, should I go for a postdoc or should I switch after the PhD? So in, in, a, in a sense, are postdocs necessary to get a job in industry? I think the answer is that depends. Mm -hmm. That's not very helpful, but it depends on uh, what career you're going into, uh, you know, I, I don't think a postdoc is necessary. I guess that's the best answer. Uh, I think that, you know, if you're still have some uncertainty about, you know, what you're transitioning to, or if perhaps your, your network is not developed and you don't have that foot in the door into that, that industry, um, or even if the economy is not right, you know, I, um, it really depends. Uh, I think a postdoc uh, selected, a well-selected postdoc can't hurt you. Totally agree, Candice. Anybody else want to jump in or? I, I totally agree. I think the, for me, the, the postdoc was really invaluable to establish myself as an expert in the, the field, something that um, it allowed me to build those connections and deeper knowledge that I was able to take into my career later. This is an interesting one. How important is a good LinkedIn profile for industry? I noticed lots of people in academia are not present on LinkedIn. I, 
I can try to take a stab at it. Um, yeah. I don't think it's required, um, but I certainly, during hiring processes, look at people's LinkedIn pages. Um, it gives you an opportunity to express yourself beyond just a resume, I think. Um, and it allows you to possibly, you know, establish your communication style um, in a way that, that you know, is, is apparent for, for other people. If you wanna post articles um, on topics of interest and, and show your expertise in an area, this could be a nice place for it um, in, a, in a business or professional setting. I'm gonna throw something out there that's somewhat related because I don't see it that anybody's necessarily asked this. And this may be just for, for our group, but we actually, when people are applying for jobs, yeah, we might look at your LinkedIn profile, but we actually, you know, ask for cover letters because that really matters to us. I don't know how many other people still do. We don't get so many applications that we need to use AI to sift them through. But I, I can guarantee you that if you're, you know, cover let if you don't have a cover letter or your cover letter is generic, if you don't really express an interest in in what it is that we're doing or that you've at least sort of like research things. Um, in a meaningful kind of way, then we're probably not going to, you know, take your application, um, uh, you know, to that next level. Because, you know, if you don't do your homework, then I don't think that you're really that interested. <laughs> I don't know how other people are when they're looking at applications, but we, we care about that. Thanks for bringing that up. That is something that I think is really important. Um, I, it's the first thing I look at is someone's cover letter. Um, it helps direct me to different portions of their resume, which can get pretty long when people have had extensive experience in, in either academia or, or industry. Um, so it, it really, it does communicate the why of you want, um, the, why you want the position and then to yeah direct you to those specific experiences that make you the best candidate for the position. It's a little off topic, but I love that suggestion. <laughs> All right, another question. So for those of you working at companies, what were the most important factors you looked at when choosing which company to apply to? Well, the one that offered me a job was, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that was a big factor. Um, you know, you, you don't always have those opportunities. If you do, uh, you're, you're blessed. Uh, but one of the things I would say, you know, whatever your options are, is look to people who you think are going to be good mentors. Uh, look to people who you think are, are really going to help you develop, reach your potential, and, you uh, uh, give you a good direction and promote your career. I'll, I'll jump in. This is also a little bit kind of meandering from the main point, but um, so for me, I, I'm part of a dual career couple. And so geography has guided a lot of my um, opportunities for my career. Um, so that happens. Um, and a cover letter is a great place to explain that. Um, <laughs> but I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it, I think what Charlie said about finding people who will be supportive and good mentors is a, is a good uh, strategy. Um, and we, we can't always be super selective um, about where we end up. So I'll, I can address that in a very specific way, just because I had the opportunity. I was had two different offers and one was actually working in the industry um, for a fairly large company. Um, that had, uh, you know, different requirements as far as um, where the work environment. So, you know, I would have had to be commuting four days a week at least, um, as opposed to the opportunity that I did take, which allowed me to um, work from home. Um, so there were differences in terms of salary. There's differences in terms of, of size. But what I opted for was um, work-life balance. That, that really mattered to me, <laughs> that I didn't want to spend my life on the road in the Bay Area, which is, you know, 
a terrible traffic, at least it used to be. Um, and I, I opted for, um, you know, an environment that I felt like I had more of an opportunity to have an impact because it was smaller and I could do more things that made more of a difference as opposed to being a cog in a wheel. I will have to say like the, the job that I, I found the most um, difficult operationally was working in a large university. So what I realized is that I like working um, in the sort of small startup place because you get to wear lots of different hats, which I enjoy. Um, and, and things move very quickly. You don't have like layers and layers and layers of, of administration to deal with. So, you know, it was, it, I, I, I gave up, I think probably a lot of money for what I think is a more enjoyable um, job and better work-life balance. So we have about four more minutes. Laura, do you wanna? Um, I think we can go ahead and continue with the, the questions yeah. in the chat box. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions, but I'm giving you know priority to the ones that have been voted up. So one that I think is an interesting one, what are the differences between joining a big biotech company versus a startup? So um, I work with all, I work with startups a lot, uh, and um, so I can I can speak a little bit about I've not worked in a big big biotech co biotech company, but I can I can tell you a little bit about startup life and how I think it's probably different. Um, so uh, in a startup, uh, your resources are highly limited, and your deadlines are extremely tight. Uh, so uh, somebody else said, you know, you are uh, required to wear many hats and be very flexible and be very comfortable with uncertainty. Um, and uh, if you can do those things, it can be really, really fun versus I think in a larger company, uh, things are more structured. You know, some startups that we have worked with, they don't even have uh, billing sort of their accounting in, in place. So you have to develop all of the processes versus in a bigger company, all of those roles are really defined and the processes are defined. Uh, there's more structure and there's um, uh, more certainty probably to what your day to day will be like in a given week. Thanks, Candice. Maybe one last question, I think, for Kathy Monfold. Could you please expand more on the concept of open innovation compared to regular innovation? Yeah, sure. So um, when we talk about regular innovation, we also, we, we usually think about in the past, at least in industry, how companies just focused on building a really strong internal R&D department to generate ideas and bring them through the pipeline to, to build their products. Through open innovation, we're just looking more broadly than that um, to bring outside, outside ideas into the company and into our pipeline to help us innovate better uh, through collaborations, through different types of relationships. Um, because we know that, you know, we have a lot of smart people in our company, but there are many, many more smart people outside of our company. And tapping into, um, you know, those adjacent spaces that maybe aren't focused on agriculture, maybe interacting with people in, in the biomed space, engineering, um, you can you can bring a lot of innovation in at those intersections of um, fields. But we also look at open innovation as a way to take some of the ideas or intellectual property that we develop in the company outside and share it with the community. So at Corteva, um, we have a strong IP position in the CRISPR space, but we understand the power of that technology and we don't wanna hold that technology within just the four walls of our company. So we do make licenses available to anyone in the community um, to work with that. And we're also looking at some of the IP that's generated um, within the company as it 
maybe it doesn't find a, a place in a product. So we're looking at ways of, of sharing that or, you know, and sometimes sometimes it can be licensing. We may look to to even sell it to other industries to be more useful in the community. So so we run, um, just to finish up, we, we do run um, challenges through our open innovation website on particular topics. Um, and we invite people to engage with us. So I know there's a lot of scientists out there. You can take a look on our open innovation website and maybe we'll be talking about collaborations in the future. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, Katie, should we turn it over to you to, to wrap up? Sure. Yeah, this has been a really great webinar. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining. Um, thank you, Laura and Miguel, for getting this, this started. Um, we are planning to do kind of more in this series. Um, that was one thing when we got together to think of who to invite, we immediately had a giant list of folks. So um, stay tuned and make sure that you're um, join ASPB and also be part of the Plante community so that you can be on the list for these webinars. Um, there's been a lot of links in, in the chat box as well. So if you missed any of those or, or need any more you know, connections to information, um, feel free to email me. My email is krogers at ASPB.org. Yeah, thank you all for joining. And um, we'll be continuing these conversations on Twitter and also on our blog. So feel free to keep on asking the questions. This has been really great. Thank, thank you, you to all the panelists for, for joining our webinar today. Mm -hmm. It's yes, been fun talking everybody. with you. And thank you Thanks everyone for, for attending as well. Great question. Thank you.